everybody out. It's good to be able to be out, of course. And it's, uh, it's great to be able to come together to study God's Word. Um, a little empty tonight with everybody that we've got traveling, so let's remember them. And, of course, all, also all of those that are sick, we don't have health issues. Um, before we get started this evening, go ahead and uh, lead us in a word of prayer, if you would bow with me this time. O oh, great and holy and wonderful and merciful Father in heaven, you who have created all things and have made us so wonderfully, your power is magnificent, Father, your wisdom beyond comprehension. And we bow to you and we thank you that you've done so many things for us, more so, Father, than we could count. We thank you especially for today that you have given us to be here on this world and to be able to walk and work, to be able to influence others, Father, that they might come to know your love as we do, and to come together tonight to study your word and to worship you so we might grow stronger spiritually, Father, that we might grow closer to you. We pray, Father, for all of those that are not able to be here, Father, that would, those that are traveling, that you would protect them and be with them, Father, and bring them to us again. And those that are sick, Father, that you would heal them, to be with those that are ministering to them, that they might be able to come out and worship you with us once more. And for those that are shut in, Father, that you would be with them and help them, Father, to keep them strong and not let them falter. We pray for all of those that are suffering, Father, those worldwide are suffering things such as famine and war. We pray, Father, that those that have the power would see what they should do to help to alleviate those things, that we might realize the things that we need and put away from us the things that we don't need and to not be greedy for gain where we hurt others. We pray, Father, that you would be with us and help us to turn away from sin and sinful things because your son died on the cross for our sins. And these things should be far from us, Father. We should put them away where they are not in front of us. We should turn our backs on them. We pray that you would help us to do so and forgive us of the things that we do that where we will reek and fail. We pray that everything taught here would be in accordance with your word, Father, that we might be a light of truth to the world and we might help others. All these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, the people have conquested the land, as it would be. And so it's a, uh, all of the major battles being done. And they've divided the land up amongst the tribes. And it is time for Joshua to give one last reminder to the people. And of course, we went through and it talks about how Joshua had been, Joshua told the people what God had said about how he was the one that called Abraham from the other side of the river. And he was the one that had blessed Abraham. And he was the one that was with Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Talked about how he was the one that brought them up out of Egypt. And he was the one that kept them. All those 40 years they were wandering. And also that God was the one that drove everyone out before them. But it was not your own arrows or anything else. It was the Lord. So the reminder is to love the Lord, verse 11. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them, so that you associate with them and they with you. Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive them out from before you. There will be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord has given you. So Joshua says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. I'm going to die, but remember, nothing that the Lord has promised has failed to come to pass. All the good things, but also all of the evil things. And if you leave from what the Lord has told you to do, then all of those evil things 
will come to pass until you are destroyed from off this land. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he has given you. And so there's a uh, the reminder. You know, remember this. Remember this, remember this, remember this. They've been told multiple times. <clears throat> you know, Moses has repeated it multiple times. It has been stressed as much as anything else that has been told to the Israelites. You know, as much as all of, the, all of the different things that they were to do and the different ways they were to hold God in reverence and the ways they were to worship him were stressed. This has been stressed just as much as any one of those things has been stressed. You must drive these people out. You must destroy them. You must not be around them and their influence. And so he gathers all the tribes together at Shechem. And he tells them again who did what. God did all of it. He brought them into the land. He defeated all of those against them. He thwarted the curses that Balaam was supposed to throw and changed them to blessings. He destroyed Jericho. He destroyed the kings of the Amorites. He gave them a land that they would not have to labor, cities they wouldn't have to build to dwell in. And so Joshua says, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness, and put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me, for my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery and who did those great signs in our sight and served us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed, and the Lord drove out before us all the people, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. And this here is a, is a very good, good part to, uh, to mark here. Who is it, the people here that are, that are choosing to say that they will serve the Lord? Well, those that... Them and their fathers were brought up out of the land of Egypt. The ones that saw all of the wonders that the Lord did in the way. And the ones that know. Joshua said, You're not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. Then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. You do realize this is not a God that's going to sit here and abide by you slipping up. This is not a God that's going to sit by and be okay with you falling in the way and deciding to turn and deciding to go and, and to do other things other than what he's commanded. This is a God that demands that you be holy like he is holy. He is not going to put up with it. It's a hard thing that you choose. You better make sure that, that is what, it, what you're going to do. The people said, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. And he repeated, put away all the foreign gods that are amongst you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God, we will serve and his voice we will obey. And so he made the covenant with the people that day and put, a place, put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. 
And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. So, is stone really going to talk to the people? No, not really, huh? How's the stone a good witness? Monument. The monument. What are monuments to remind us of? If you go down the road and you see a, a cemetery out there with a whole bunch of, they're, they're, you know, the headstones are also called monuments. What are, what are, we, what are those for? You look at them, you see them, you recognize that there was a person there. Or you drive along and you, you come to some park or historical, mon uh, historical uh, uh, building or such, and they've got a little monument outside. It tells you, you know, this happened here. Well, this rock, this rock is here as a reminder, another reminder. You said you would serve the Lord. So when, you get a, when you're going along and you look, you see this rock, that's another reminder, serve the Lord. So Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. And after these things, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in his own inheritance at Timnath Sarah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of the Gosh. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. We'll come back to that in a minute. And as for the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem in the piece of land that Jacob brought, bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. And it became an inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. Anybody remember where Joseph said he would, it, it told them that he should be buried originally? And he also wanted to be buried in the cave of Machpelah? I'm guessing by now they've lost where that was. But still, they brought his, they, they, uh, as, as he had said it in faith, and they brought his bones home and buried them. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gibeah, the town of Phinehas' his son, which had been given him in the hill country of Ephraim. And so, now look what's happened. We have in a, in a we call it an incredibly short you know, in these few years of time at least. We've lost Joshua. And you've lost Eleazar. And you've got the, the two, as far as it goes, highest ranking people, the, 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 your, your two biggest leaders, and you've lost both of them. And so how the people go now, right? Is going to be a, a, a uh, going to have a lot to do with how the rest of the country will go from from here on out, is it not? Kind of like one of those things is the uh, uh, the kids. You know, you're you're uh, uh, really how good a kid you are, depending on what you do when your parents ain't watching. You know, mom and dad aren't there to see see what happens. Um, the other note on give you. Can you, what, you can kind of see it in, in the map a little bit. It's harder to see up here. But there are three cities really close together, Geba, Gibeon, and Gibeah. Gibeah is where Eleazar is buried. If we remember, Gibeon was the uh, home of the Hivites, the, the ones that, uh, that tricked the Israelites into sparing them, and Geba is a Philistine Garrison. All right. That ends the book of Joshua and going into the book of Judges, but there is. Lost my cursor. Oh, there you are. Hiding from me. There is, of course, a lot 
to be uh, a lot to be said about where we're at. You know, the major battles have been fought, and each tribe has been assigned its portion. Each family has its own farm. Joshua has died, but they still have their king, God, right? They still have their guide, the law. They just don't have a physical person going around and giving them pushes. It's like when you move out of the house for the first time, you know, you're out away from the parents. You have all of your knowledge. You have all of the all of the things that you should have. How do you react? And one of the clearest points, like we said, that God has made: drive out the Canaanites. Period. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. You know, one of the things we were talking about, and I, and I thought about uh, with Wes's lesson Sunday, he, you know, he talked about how people, people are winding up on the wrong side of the fence. And I've seen reasonable people wind up on the wrong side of, uh, of uh, these things. And one of the things that I've noticed is they'll, they'll take and say that the, uh, the other persons, they were on two sides of, an, uh, of a debate about the... Uh, uh, those kind of issues, but, but the, uh, uh, the person that's kind of waffling back and forth, he, he agrees with other things that are believed by other sides. Say the, uh, uh, you know, the person that would be normally be on the wrong side of the debate from him, but he sees that they agree on things like, you know, whether or not the uh, 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 laws that should protect a union should be there, or whether or not the uh, that health care should be accessed by all or things like that, you know, whether or not people should be paid more so that they can actually afford housing or at least if housing should be cheaper so that people can afford it, things like that. And so they agree on some things, which is not bad. But he says, well, why can't we agree on everything? And it starts going and he says, well, maybe I can compromise on these other things. I mean, it's not that far of a compromise to get where we're at right now, right? Here's the same thing. If you sit, if these people are around you, right, and if the, the God has said that these people are what? An abomination, right? All the things that they've done, they, they deserve to be absolutely destroyed, right? Keep them around you. Start being friendly with them. Then you decide what? Well, not so bad after all, right? Right? Me and a, a Haley over here will hang out after work. You know? Things like that. God wants them. Remember Deuteronomy 7. You must devote them to complete destruction. Show no mercy to them. Because friends, and then maybe your children get married, so well, now I can't really, uh, you know, slaughter my uh, my uh, son's father-in-law, and that daughter is going to say, "Well, I'm going to go worship with them with their gods." Oh, well, okay. Well, then it comes down to, well, what's more important, following the word, what the word of God says, or do I kill my daughter-in-law now? Or then, when my son decides to go worship, do I have to, do I have to stone him too? And that's a tough decision. And I just go do it. Every, every little decision leads to a worse one. And it seems reasonable not to have to do this. But it, if we just followed, right, what God wanted to in the first place, we wouldn't be on this path. Because if your children marry, it will turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods, and the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will destroy you quickly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall break down their altars, and dash in pieces their pillars, and chop down their ashram, and burn their carved images with fire. Utter destruction. There shall be nothing but ashes left of anything that they used for worship. You shall smash all of the, 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 if it doesn't burn, you'll smash it to powder. That's how it should do. 
That's how it should be handled. Because you are supposed to be God's treasured possession. And all of these things are filthy. They are corrupt. They are polluted. This is, it would be like somebody coming along, opening up your nice fresh water and dumping some used motor oil in it. You shall consume all the people that the Lord your God will give to you, and your eyes shall not pity them, neither shall you serve their gods, for it would be a snare to you. You shall make their name perish from under the heaven. Think about this. If you remember, what's one of the worst things that can happen to an Israelite family? For the name to perish, right? That's why the entire point is, you know, if the, uh, if the oldest son dies without having any heirs, then his brother should go and marry the wife and the firstborn son. That's going to be, that's his brother's son instead. That's the, whole, that's the whole point of that entire tradition, was to make sure that their name did not perish. So God's telling him, these people deserve for their name to perish. It's a very serious thing that he tells them. If they've done, if they've done that badly, and they've done very bad indeed, badly indeed, burn the carved images of their God. Even if they've got little gems on them, even if they've got precious gold or silver on them, burn it. Even if, because even if you take it off of there, it is still an abomination. It is unclean because you know what it came off of. And he wants them to treat it like even touching it is bad. Because that's the way it must be in their minds. And you, you can think of the list of things that, that even today it would be the same for us, right? Filthy money, things that have gotten, gotten dishonestly, all the various propaganda and uh, pornographic materials that are out there, all of these things, he, want, he wants us to treat it the same way as if it would hurt us to even touch it. That's the idea of what we should be. You shall utterly detest and abhor it. You know, for a, for a, well, the strange thing about this, all of this, the way this is talked about, reminds me of rabies. There's the uh, strange looks I was looking for. Yeah. You know what rabies does? One of the things that it does is it makes you hydrophobic. You, you cannot go near or drink water. It will, may, it will make you vomit if you try to drink water. This is that idea. The idea that even the thought of going near it makes you sick. That is how we should detest. That's how the Israelites were told to detest all of these things in this people. An invite should be an involuntary thing to you. Just the thought of it should automatically make you sick. That's how bad you should hold them in your mind. Dispossess them. Even though they're great, I will give them to you, but you must drive them out and make them perish quickly. You mustn't falter in these things. Now, does that mean that it would all happen in a day? No. You take the land a little bit by a little bit. And why is that? Well, anybody ever garden? You guys garden? Yeah. You gotta weed that garden, don't you? That or you just let the grass grow over it like I let it grow over mine plants still produce. Just got to give them a little bit of extra water and extra fertilizer, make up for the grass. But still, point being, you leave all this farmland, all these lands empty, for the time it takes you to destroy all the people, what's going to happen? You're going to fill up with wild and beasts, and now all of a sudden they're not fields that you didn't have to, to plow yourself because you're going to have to replow them to get rid of all the stuff that's in them. So the point being is you, you will, they've destroyed the main part of them. All the ones that would be able to gather together and cause them large amounts of trouble and be a threat to all of Israel, they've destroyed any group like that, any city like that. Now they've got to go back and they've got to destroy all the rest of the small remnants here and there. 
and all the villages and such. But God will give them over to you and throw them into great confusion until they're destroyed. What's the biggest little word in the Bible? If. If you'll be careful to do all this commandment, then he will drive them out before you. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to the Lebanon and from the river to the river Euphrates, the western sea, and no one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you shall tread as he promised you. It's a pretty simple thing. What did God tell Joshua several times right, right at the beginning, right when he was first uh, promoted to leader of the people? All he had to do, be strong and courageous. Follow what the Lord said. That's all you've got to do, Israel. Be strong and courageous. Don't worry about how many people are in front of you. Know the Lord has your back. And it's all you've got to do. And you'll win the day. Sounds simple, doesn't it? No. Unfortunately, the theme of, the theme of this, this part of our study is, well, compromise. We compromise on what the Lord has said. We compromise on, on, in our attitude. And it causes failure. I mean, it starts off good enough. After the death of Joshua, the people inquired of the Lord. Really good place to start. And he said, who goes up first against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up, and I have given the land into his hand. Brother Walter notes, the book of Judges begins by describing the efforts of the tribes to drive out the Canaanite inhabitants within their borders, including a little bit of the time back right around the time before Joshua died. After Joshua's death, the tribes made a good start. And if all of them had done as well as Judah, and if all of them had followed through with the project, their history would have been quite different. Because Judah has some success here. Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek at Bezek, fought against him, and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And Adonai Bezek fled. They pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes because, he said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps from under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. And the men of Jer Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set it on fire. And my, afterwards, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country, the Negev, the lowland. And Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba. And they defeated Sheshai and Heman and Talmai. And from there they went against the inhabitants of Debir. And if we remember this, this was also something that was gone over in the book of Joshua. We talked about Caleb said, He who attacks Kiriath's affair and captures it, I will give him Action, my daughter, for a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. And so he gave him his daughter for a wife. And Judah went with Simeon and his brother, and they defeated the Canaanites who inhabited Zephath and devoted it to destruction. And so the name of the city was called Hormah. Judah also captured Gaza and its territory, and Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. Doing quite well, if you'll remember. Remember, we know these names. You hear Gaza every, a lot of times in the news over the years, even now. But we know these names because we, have, we know these names for a different reason. These aren't Judah's strongholds in the near future, are they? No. Who do they belong to? The Philistines. But... You captured all these cities. So what happens? We'll find out. Anyways, continuing. And descendants of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah from the city of, Psalm, of Palms into the wilderness of Judah, and they settled with the people. 
And so Judah is doing very well at this moment. They're going and they're doing things that they're supposed to do. But, all the buts. Judah took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. So quick question, did the chariots of iron prevent Judah from winning this? No. What would have prevented Judah from winning this? Lack of faith, lack of trust. Yeah, they're not completing the task. They see those chariots of iron and they're afraid instead of their enemies. And maybe they become a bit of a, a bit like grasshoppers in their own eyes, right? Like it was with the spies that didn't have faith. And so Judah didn't have faith and they didn't drive out the inhabitants. The people of Benjamin didn't drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. Despite the fact that Judah even captured the city and burned it. How much farther is it just to go up and finish those guys off? But Benjamin, they didn't do it. And so the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Matter of fact, we remember, the Jebusites will not be driven out of Jerusalem until David does it. Quite a long ways in the future. Why? Because if you let these people stay, I will not drive them out. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and its villages, or Tanak and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor, or the inhabitants of Iblim, or the inhabitants of Megiddo. For the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. When Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they didn't drive them out completely. And Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites and Gezer, and so they lived there. Zebulun did not drive out all the inhabitants of the cities amongst them. Asher did not drive out the Phoenicians. They were up amongst their coasts. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. So here's the issue. Well, we're strong and we can, we can put them to forced labor. You know what? That sounds really good. I don't like having to chop wood, right? Who wouldn't mind if somebody else always cut their grass? Yeah. Yeah. I could do without having to cut grass. Some people find it relaxing. I find it too much work, you know? And so there's some, some, some labors that we like to do and some we don't like too much. And hey, look, there's people there that we can make do the stuff that we don't like to do too much. It's a great idea, isn't it? Yeah, great idea. And so uh, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you. They shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. God was telling the truth. Wasn't he when he said, I will never... Break my covenant with you. What do you have to have for a covenant? Two people, right? You've got to have two people to have a covenant with each other. It also means that either side can break that covenant, right? Now here's the thing. You have one side of the covenant that says, I will give you everything that you need. I will only ever do good for you, and I will not be the one to break this covenant. I will not. 
How hard is it to find somebody that you can rely on sometimes? You know, we've got folks around us sometimes, you know, whether it's, it's work or whether you're out uh, doing some activity with some, some odd group of people or something, and always, sometimes it seems like, man, it's just, it's just hard to find good help, right? Hard to find somebody that, that, that doesn't leave you hanging sometimes. Well, here the Israelites, they've got somebody that will, that will always, always, always be there to pick up the slack and help them out. Swore to do it. Swore to be the one that would help them no matter what the need. All they had to do was trust him and follow what he said. And yet they didn't. They broke the covenant. Okay. I will keep to the exact terms of what I said would happen if you break it. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke those words to all the people of Israel, they lifted up their voices and wept. And so they called the name of that place Bochum, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. The name of it is weeping. So when Joshua dismissed the people, and they went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land, the people of the Lord served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works that the Lord had done for Israel. But this is a big, big point right here, I think. And this, this is probably the biggest, biggest point. Because, yes, this generation that was with Joshua, that had seen all the works that the Lord had done, they served the Lord all the days of their lives, but, buddy, they failed in one big way. doesn't explicitly tell us that they failed right here, but I can guarantee you there's one way that they failed. What was it? Teaching the children. What does it say in Deuteronomy 6? These words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk about them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, you will bind them for a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You will write them upon the posts of your house and on your gates. Why? So you don't forget God? You know, we're, we're as far as, as, a, uh, as a species would go, as we call it, we got pretty short attention spans and memories, don't we? It's really easy to, to, to be the, what have you done for me lately, and have that attitude, isn't it? Or only be able to see what's right in front of our face. I can't remember this. It's been more than two days ago. Right? I know we talk about the joke all the time. Sometimes it's hard to remember things that are not right there, but in all honesty, Honestly, it's hard for us to remember things that are not right there. And so God said, well, in that case, I mean, I know you'll, you'll have a problem with it, so be sure to keep this right there all the time. You've got to write it on the posts of your house so that you see it every day. He wasn't literally commanding them to write it on their posts, on every single post and everything else, but it's, the thought is there. If it will help you, if it will make sure that you don't forget, yeah, write it on your post. Go right ahead. Put it on your table. Put it at the bottom of your bowl. That way when you're done with your cereal in the morning, it's right there. Put it at the bottom of your coffee cup so that's the last thing you see for you when you're done with your coffee in the morning. But put it in front of you. That way when something comes along and says, hey, you know, I want to take your attention away from God, all you've got to do is look down and it's right there. Because otherwise what will happen? It will take your attention away from God. And so a whole group of folks, they're used to depending on God. And they take for granted that their children aren't going to have to depend on God as much as they did. And so they're not going to be as inclined to go and to... Uh, Seek out God as hard as these folks did. And yet we did that as a country. 
I mean, yeah, it's coming and gone in waves, but it's, pre it, it's pretty much the same thing. Back when folks had it harder, more folks believed in God, right? I don't have it with me. I've got a picture. No, I've got a picture on my phone. I can, I, uh, I'm pretty sure I can show you, uh, uh, show you all later, but it's basically, it's a map of the U.S. states. It says uh, it, it's color-coded by the percentage of people that believe in God. Alabama and Mississippi, over 80%. Yeah, people they, they make fun of us for being backwards and all that other stuff, but you know, for being some of the poorer states and having it maybe a little harder than everybody else, we still have a little bit of faith. But some of these other states that are a bit richer, that have decided they don't need to rely on God, what do they do? Well, a couple of them, are less than 40% of people admit to believing in God. That's a small number. And so the same thing happened here. They went, and they, they went into a life of ease. And so, yeah, all the folks that had to live the hardships and, and had to, to fight all the major battles to get through the land, yep. But now all these folks, you can imagine, you started to settle down, and you've got to drive all the rest of the people off. But you've already got a farm. You've already got a wife and kids. You've already got this nice little place. Man, it's a lot of trouble to get up and go drive these people out now instead of an urgent thing that the Lord needs you to do. And it's a hard thing to have to leave three times a year to go up to, uh, uh, you know, I, I think leave Shiloh at this point where they've got the, uh, the tabernacle to, uh, to worship the Lord. And, you know, some folks are nearby, but man, some folks got to come from quiet ways. They got to cross the Jordan. Well, it's hard to do all of these things that, that, that God wants us to do. It's easy just to sit at home because we've got it easy. Just like all the folks that'll sit at home these days because you know, why do I have to go to church? I can sit here and just watch it on TV. I got all my choice of churches to choose from. I don't have to worry about you know which one I want to, to look at or go to or be, be an interactive member of any of them. I don't have to worry about feeling judged when I'm not there. It's easy, right? Because we two minute warning. Because we didn't uh, we, did, we made the same mistake. History repeats itself. We made the exact same mistake that the Israelites did at the end of jo the life of Joshua. The exact same mistake. And so Joshua died and they buried him. And all that generation gathered, were gathered to their fathers and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Uh, and this, as far as it goes, is one of the sadder verses in all of the Bible. Well, that. For something that was so preventable. So preventable. All the people had to do was be diligent. And it's an especially big point to make today. You know, we talk all the time about, the, or at least I read, I hear all the time about the, the percentage of folks, of students, they go off to college and they fall away. Not because, I mean, there, there is a good bit of it, of, of issues at, with campuses and folks that don't believe and all the propaganda they throw, throw at you. But just as much on these numbers, on those percentages, I, I, I'm willing to guarantee you, are those that the word wasn't written on the doorpost. And if I don't, you know, that's the biggest thing. If I don't live it, and I don't make sure that my kids know it while they're still there, how can I expect them to know it and, and stick with it when I'm not right there with them? And that's where we don't want to get just like where the Israelites got. Well, thanks, everybody, for the kind attention you've paid. It's not all the time we have tonight. Lord willing, we'll pick up there on Sunday.
Over in the book of uh, Luke, the 10th chapter, there's an expression that the Lord used there. This is in the setting of the return of the 70. He had sent out 70 disciples to go and to preach the kingdom of heaven was coming. And when they came back, they were so excited about the work that God had done through them. Verse 17 of Luke 10 the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In just a minute, we don't really have time to, to give much thought about this, but I would just say that when he talks here about these miraculous signs and wonders that, that they were able to perform, that was not something God promised for every one of his people all for all time. It was a special dispensation that God gave for a special purpose. Uh, I don't believe demon possession is something that happens throughout every generation, but God allowed it then for the purpose of casting out the demons to show that the kingdom of heaven had come. And so it was a special thing. But he said, here's the thing. You rejoice in these wonders that I do through you, but the greatest thing that you have are not those miraculous gifts that you have. The thing that you have that's best and greatest above all else is this fact, your names are written in heaven. That expression or that concept of your names being written in heaven is found several times in the scriptures. For example, if you go back over to Philippians chapter four, Paul is, is writing uh, to a good church and he's writing about being selfless and appreciating, in, in many ways, how that church exemplified that. They were a selfless group uh, and had been very generous with Paul. But the, the, the closest thing to a negative note in the book is found over in the fourth chapter. Uh, Philippians 4 and verse 2, where Paul writes, I beseech Euodius, and I beseech Syntyche, that they may be of the same mind in the Lord. That implies that here are these two women, probably very good women, who were crossways with each other, even in the church in the first century. Uh, not a new problem. He said, and I, verse 3, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, some brother that he's writing to there, help, he says, those women which labored with me in the gospel with Clement also, and with my other fellow laborers whose names are written in the book of life. He calls it here the book of life. That's where their names are written. He said to the 70, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And he says about these, he's mentioning in this letter, he said their names are written in the book of life. I don't think that uh, he's talking about a literal book made out of paper and some kind of binding or even a scroll and a literal ink pen. There may be some accommodative language here. But I think the point is very real, that in heaven, God knows the name of his own. Every one, he knows them by name. He knows those that belong to, to himself. He knows them now. He knows them while they're living. And if you'll notice with me in the book of Revelation, in the 20th chapter, we find again reference, I think, to the same concept of, of the, the saved whose names are written in heaven. In Revelation chapter 20, and in verse 12, well, verse 11, let's begin there. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. 
And the dead were judged out of those things which, which were written in the books according to their works. That on the day of judgment, on that last day, men will be judged based on what they've done. And those who have obeyed God, their names are written in the book of life. Look with me uh, a little bit further in verse 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the other choice. Either a person's name is written in the book of life or it's going to be eternal fire. Notice again, this is not arbitrary. God doesn't just throw a dart against the wall and say, oh, well, that fellow's saved, this one's lost. It is according to what we have done. It's our choice to obey God or to not obey him. And for those who obey him, their names are written in the book of life. I'll tell you, that's the only thing that matters when it all said and done. That's what the Lord told those 70. The thing that counts, the thing to rejoice in, is the fact that your name is written there. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27, he writes about a place, a city, where the glory of God is the light. I think he's talking here about heaven in this figurative language. And he says, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. There's another way it's described. The Lamb's book of life. Jesus is the Lamb of the world. That's where we want our name. My question to you tonight is, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Look with me, if you will, back in uh, Revelation chapter 13. Back up a few pages in Revelation chapter 13. In verse 8, he's talking here in this, this marvelous picture of a great beast that threatens the people of God. And all the people that are upon the earth do worship him, verse 8 says. Who are they? Who would worship the beast instead of God? Whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Not everybody's name is written in the lamb's book of life. There are some that are not headed for heaven. They're not fitted for it. That's not the choice that they've made. And God doesn't force us to go to heaven. That's up to us. And I'll tell you something else that, that's rather sobering. If you keep backing up here in Revelation chapter 3 and in verse 5, when we find here the letter that the Lord sent to the church at Sardis, he made this promise, Revelation 3 and verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. The Lord makes the promise to those that overcome, their name will not be blotted out of the book of life. What does that tell you? It tells you there's some who could be blotted out of the book of life. There's some that never will be written there. And then there are those who choose to serve God and faithfully serve him. And they're his own. Their names are written in the book of life. And he one day will reward them. You know, it seems to me that's another way of saying these are those who belong to Christ. These are those who belong to the body of Christ. That's another way, I think, of describing the saved in the scriptures. The body of Christ. Uh, over in uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul there wrote that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. And I can say this to you. It's not a mystery how one gets into Christ and how one becomes a part of the family of God and how one uh, is uh, blessed to be written in the book of life. Look with me back a page or so in Galatians chapter 3 and in verses 26 and 27. And there Paul wrote that ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. 
For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now that's how we get into Christ. is through faith and is through baptism. A man confessing Jesus' name and coming in repentance in faith is baptized into Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. You can have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. You can have your name written there tonight if you will obey the Lord and his commands. I'll say this. I'd sure hate to, to, to chance another night and my name not be written in that book. But God leaves that choice to us. He won't force us. But he sure does call us and plead with us. Will you answer that call? Please get out your songbook and turn to the number that's been selected. If it be your desire tonight to obey the gospel, then please let us know how we might help you in that regard. We long to receive you. The Lord longs to receive you. If we can help you in any way, let us know right now while we stand and sing. Will you come? I am resolved no longer to linger, charm by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have the Lord my side. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad. to see you this evening. Appreciate the presence of each one. We're still missing some of our number, and that includes uh, the Bradleys and the Darren Odoms and the Swindles who are all out of town uh, worshiping down in South Alabama or Florida, perhaps I should say. We do have a number that are sick, uh, and that includes uh, Diana and uh, Donna Brown. Uh, Walter is still under quarantine, I suppose. He's still suffering the effects of COVID. Please do pray for him. Uh, Donna Tice is still struggling after her uh, heart attack uh, and uh, trying to get the medicine right and get her feeling better. So please remember Donna and her family. Remember also uh, Sister Vines. Remember the Drakes who are getting better but still under quarantine. Hopefully they'll end soon. Uh, also, please remember the Stishers and Sister Keel and Sister Burns. Also, please remember Brother Purvey. He's here tonight, but he's got a couple of procedures coming up uh, in the next few weeks. And uh, I know he would appreciate uh, prayers on his behalf and those that are working with him, the doctors, that they might be able to help him and get him back to feeling better. 
Um, there's still a couple I, I have not heard from and we just have to check on. Um, but uh, others that we uh, do know about and are concerned about, maybe not of this number, but on our hearts, uh, please remember Rick Hayes. Uh, please remember Miss Eagle, that's uh, uh, Miss Jean's sister-in-law up in Ohio. Uh, last report she got uh, from her cancer was not good. Please do remember, remember her family. Uh, Ed Rangel from Hueytown, I think, has uh, been diagnosed with Parkinson's, so please do remember him as he works to, to uh, try to get that under control. Jeremy McKeever, I haven't heard from him since Monday, but he was looking to go home, and I do not know, haven't heard a report, but please remember uh, the McKeevers. Brandon Miller, who is undergoing cancer treatment, and also Sister Carswell, who's recovering from surgery. Please remember all these. Um, if you would. Also, real quick, uh, the, uh, the sign-up sheet for leading in service. Brother Marcus is uh, working on that list, and please do, if you would, make time, if you haven't already, fill that out, get that back to Marcus, and we'll keep making that announcement as we get more of our folks back. That's quite a list, and I'm sure I've forgotten some obvious things. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Somebody, yes, sir. Uh, I got a text from Sister Kathy earlier that uh, she uh, she actually she's been having some, some dental work done. She's had I think surgery and things of that nature. And her parent, I think, to do some more surgical procedures. She went to the dentist today. So she's not feeling well this evening. To have, I think, one of those procedures done next week, and they move that up to tomorrow. Not exactly sure what, what's going to be done, but um, she's going to have some sort of procedure, uh, dental procedure done tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, us to keep her in our prayers. Yes, I do appreciate very much that update, too. Thank you. Someone else have a, another man have an announcement, another update. Pray for our brethren. Those that are away from us, those that are sick, traveling. Pray for those who will be traveling this week as well. It's good to see everybody here. Glad that Jaden and Gracie are back with us too. Miss Elizabeth and others that were missing Sunday. Okay. Uh, if there's nothing further then, let's uh, bow. We'll have a word of prayer together. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we're so, so grateful. Uh, for this time together. It's so short in some ways, and yet it's just so good to be with others of like faith. It is so refreshing and so helpful to uh, sit for a few moments and hear thy word read and taught and sing together and pray together. It just is a great blessing, an oasis in a, in a, a world of unbelief. We uh, are thankful, humbled by this occasion. We feel no pride. Our pride is in thee and in the truth and in the grace that you've given to us that makes it possible for us to be forgiven and to have hope and to share that hope with one another and to try, Lord, to show it to the, to the whole world. Help us as we leave this place to have that mindset that we are saved by grace and we look to share that good news with everybody who will listen. Help us, Father, as we do that. Bless our brethren and bring them back to us. Bless each one who's gathered here and uh, help us to come back together again, if it be thy will. We love thee. We thank thee for all blessings. We ask your forgiveness now in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat>